will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If it, anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. So be it. We'll start with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you would choose to love us. Even when we reject you, Father, and go our own way. You are so magnificent and awesome. Hallowed be your name. And that makes it even more magnificent and honorable that you would still love us in spite of our sin and shame. So much that you would have to send your son, and you knew this all along, to live a life as a humble ser servant, giving up heaven, living here without the joys of this world and everything, to then die for us so that we would have a home in heaven if we would simply believe in the righteous work of Jesus Christ and the completed, finished work of the cross. Lord, help us to empower our lives by the Spirit to live as Jesus lived, bringing you glory and honor. May we be sanctified through and through by your Spirit and by your Word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in your bulletins, you should have had a little insert that had some Bible verses. And I made that and gave it to you so you could refer to them as you're reading, as you're studying and everything. So if you've got them, you can pull them out. These are just some verses that mean to me, but I put them in a pattern so that you could see the promises of God and the importance of reading in His Word. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Romans 6, 17 says, But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves of sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. Matthew 5, 16 says, In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Romans 13, 12, The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. James wrote, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Hebrews 10, 23 and 24. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he whom promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another to, on towards love and good deeds. 2 Peter 1, 3. His divine power has, become, has given us everything that we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Romans 12, 2, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Psalm 34, 8, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in Him. Joshua 1, 8, Keep this book of law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Deuteronomy 6, verses 5 through 8. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts and press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Psalm 119, 16. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Psalm 51, 10. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things God works for good to those of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Philippians 3, 14. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Hebrews 12, 1. 
Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And then from Revelation 22, Look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. Just some scriptures to keep in your mind, in your heart, meditate on them. Know that God loves you. Know that Jesus' work was finished on the cross. Know that you are beloved by God. No matter what place you're in, no matter what your sin, shame is, anything else, God loves you so much that He would send His only Son to die for you so that you could have eternal life forevermore and so that you have the power to live the holy life that He requires here on this earth. So many times that gets missed as part of the gospel. If I'm saved, I'm saved and I'm okay. I can continue to sin because I can't do any better. But see, that's not scriptural. Scripture says you are a new creation in Christ. All the old things are put away. You are the hands and feet of Jesus. You have an obligation to live a holy life so that others will see it and you'll draw them to Jesus Christ. Draw them heavenward to God their Father. What a wonderful, wonderful privilege and duty you've been given. Don't miss that opportunity. Otherwise, when time is over and you don't have any more breath in your lungs, will you regret not living for God? So that's why we're here as a church, to build each other up. We're given gifts so that we can build up the body of Christ, so that we can stay strong in our faith. If you read, as you're reading through the New Testament, you'll see that over and over and over again. And this is, these letters were written within a decade of Jesus' death and resurrection. And the church was already going all over the place because we fight a spiritual battle. We need to make ourselves aware of that. And we need to fight the devil, resist him, and he will flee from us. That's not a proverb of probabilities. That's a promise of God. Because Satan's power was robbed from him when Jesus Christ laid down his life on the cross. His work was completed. It pleased God and it atoned for our sins that if we believe by faith in his message, and that's what we're going to talk about today a little bit, what his message is, then we are saved from the penalty of our sins. So have you been reading? I gave you a new plan if you weren't here. And if you weren't here, right here's some more copies. They're a little different than the one before because I forgot to save it. <laughs> so I had to take and do a little different one. I'd saved the calendar, but I hadn't saved the bifold part. So it looks a little different. But this tells you what we're doing, and it gives you what we're reading for January. And if you notice in January so far, you're going to read through the Gospel of Mark, and then you're going to start in the book of Acts. We start in Mark because Mark is probably the first gospel record written. Acts then is the story of the church. And then you're going to see you're going to follow through that pattern. A little different than what you read in the ESV chronological reading, but very, very similar, still taking what was probably written first and presenting it that way. Mark is also the shortest gospel, so it won't take you that long, 16 days to do it. You read through the week. That's why it's called the five by five by five. You read five days. There's 271 days in a normal year. There's 272 days this year, if I have my figures right. There's 270 chapters in the New Testament. Works out pretty good to read them for the five week days. But there's two extra, right, because of the leap year and the other one. So as you get to December, I put us reading Isaiah 53 on Christmas Eve and Psalm 23 and 24 on Christmas Day. I think you'll find that nice for what those chapters say. I'll give you a new calendar prior to each, so you'll have it. You read five days through the week, and then you reflect on the weekend. Pray. Think about what you've done. Take notes as you're reading, whatever you want to do to make your study more complete. And then it gives you five tips, like I just mentioned, on the studying and meditating and journaling and stuff to help you in your Bible studies. Five minutes. That's it. So no one here has an excuse. I, I know you probably get tired of me saying it, but that's my job to shepherd you. If you literally compared yourself to sheep 
and I had sheep that weren't going and getting the nutrition that they needed, then I would do whatever I needed to prod them along to get that nutrition. There are some of you that read through completely the Bible last year, and kudos to you. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. That took about 20 minutes a day, 15, 20 minutes. So I made it a little bit easier to get your, your digestion in there. But that's still milk, not meat. If you want to follow in meat, meat, I challenge you to do more. I've got a uh, daily devotional that I gave out. If you did not get one, I have a couple more copies and I've ordered some more. Just ask me and I'll give you one. And then I'm going to challenge you guys also that read through your Bible to read it through again. And I'll tell you more about that. But so far you should have read through Mark chapters 1 through 3. I told you Mark is probably the first gospel written. It's probably written by John Mark. For you guys that have read and studied, we know who that is. He was a cousin of Barnabas. He was the guy that Paul said, I'm not going to travel with him anymore. He's also the guy that Paul said later, except John Mark. See, we all go through these problems where, where we don't want to deal with each other because of our human sinful nature. But then he figured out, Paul did, and I guess John Mark did, that, hey, we're part of one body. It does me no good for my leg to be over here. I need it attached to this body, listening to this mind, so that I can walk out that door and function. John Mark was not a gospel, uh, not a gospel, was not a disciple of Christ. He was a uh, student, a fellow apostle that w went around with Paul, Luke, Timothy. Okay? He probably writes from his perspective of Peter because he was a good friend of Peter's. So as you read through, take that in mind that this is probably coming from Peter's perspective. And think about the struggles that you face in your life and the major problems and struggles that Peter faced. Boy, he let his mouth get the best of him, didn't he? He wanted to jump right into things, but he didn't have the faith to withstand that. But look what he did on Pentecost with the power of the Spirit. He stood up boldly and proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ, and people were saved. <clears throat> The book is written to the Gentile audience, so you don't have to know as much of the Old Testament to understand it. Uh, very little is quoted from the Old Testament unless it is Jesus' words being quoted. But the reason that he wrote the gospel is so that he could establish who Jesus Christ is, the Messiah. The first eight chapters tell you that. And then what Jesus Christ did and what he teaches you as his believers and followers, the last eight chapters. It's written to the Gentile world that has accepted, they didn't have all this background knowledge of the coming Messiah, but they saw the miracles, the mighty deeds of God done by the power of the Spirit, and they said, this man must be the Son of God. Remember the Roman soldier at the crucifixion that said that? This is the audience who Mark is written to. So if you read, I'm going to quickly go through some things from the first three chapters. Mark 1.1 1, 1 says, The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, if you're reading NLT, the NLT doesn't say anything about the beginning. It just says this is the good news. That's where if you're reading and studying more, you might want to read some other um, Bible translations. You might want to look back at the, the root words to see the beginning, because NLT leaves that out. The reason it's the beginning is because here's the continuation the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. When he left, he left us with his work of ministry to a lost world. So if you don't get the beginning, you're not going to see the, the path that we take to the end. And then if you don't minister to your children, and to, the, to their children and so forth, are you going to lead them to Jesus Christ? Now, yes, there's calling and election and everything. I don't want to get too far off that. But you still wouldn't have done your part. God's still sovereign, He'll save, and you don't have to worry about that. That's, those things are bigger topics, but He still called you, you, to be His hands and feet. In verse 15 it says, The time has come, He said, The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. In verse 17, Come, follow me, forsaking everything else, leaving everything else behind. Come and follow me. And I will send you out to fish for people. Notice verse 18. At once they left their nets and followed him. As you read along, you'll understand that Jesus doesn't let you make excuses. He calls you to immediately follow 
him. If you don't, then you're saying that other reason that you're not is more important than the reason that he's given you, the reason that he laid down his life to save you. In Mark 1.27, the people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this, a new teaching and with authority? He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. See, people have to talk about it when you live a life like Christ because they don't understand it. You don't do the things they do. You act differently. You're set apart living a holy life. So they have to ask each other what this is. And what's amazing in the people in that time is they saw even the demons obeyed Christ. Well, then why wouldn't they? James says, the de good that you believe. That's why he says, I need to see your works. Because he says, even the demons believe and they tremble with fear. In Mark chapter 2, verse 14, as he, as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. There's your rotten sinner. If you say, I'm not good enough, I've done these things, God can't use me, pfft, here's your answer to that. Levi, Matthew, left his tax booth. He left his wealth. He left the security of the Roman Empire and traded it for a death sentence. He abandoned the, the people that reigned over him. He left the money behind and said, I'll follow Jesus, and he did it immediately. In chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, his family, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. I guess when you're so excited about doing God's work that you can't even eat. See, even your brothers and sisters will say you've gone nuts. But that's okay. I, I don't mind being in that position. If I'm so excited that I forget to eat, then I think I'm on the right path. In verse 31 to 35, this is Jesus' answer to the people's lack of faith. Then Jesus' mothers and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Now, don't take Scripture out of context. Jesus wasn't against his mother and brother. And you see, it gives you a perfect opportunity to talk to other people. Because, oh, Jesus was, uh, was disloyal to his own family members. He didn't take pride in him. No, that's not what it's saying. It's using an example. Spiritually, your brothers and sisters that are bound together in Jesus Christ are even more important than your physical bloodlines because that's eternal. So he goes on to say, Who are my mother and br my brothers? Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mothers and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Now if you read that, there's, that account is in two other Gospels. And as you're reading, you'll see that if you read Mark first, you'll notice that Mark seems to be quoted a lot in the others because it's a shorter book. And it does look like Matthew and Luke may have used Mark's material because 95% of it, or whatever the numbers are, are given by the, those two authors, Matthew and Luke, which are much longer books. But in one of them, I think it's Luke, I'm not sure. It says, those who hear God's word and obey it. Because see, those are the ones that do God's will. That they're hearers and doers. They don't just hear the Spirit calling to them saying, you know, I think it'd be good if you go apologize to that person that you might have offended. You then go do that because that's what the Spirit's prompting you to do. So you're not very far in your reading of Mark, but you should have noticed a pattern so far. God's one and only Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy One, anointed of God, the promised Messiah, the Savior of the world, came into this world. He humbled Himself as a servant. See, that's why He was crucified, because the world couldn't understand that. The Jews ne neglected Him and crucified Him because He wasn't the Savior that they thought He should be. But that's the Savior He was, a humble servant who came to lay down his life to save you and I. So if you believe in Jesus Christ and his message, aren't you called to do the same?
Yes. <laughs> Jesus calls all those who believe in Him to come and follow after Him. Now, what does that mean to each of us? I don't know. I don't know what it means to you. But I know it means obedience even unto death. The Gospel of Mark is the shortest gospel. I told you it was 16 chapters. And there's a pivotal point in the middle of chapter 8. I assume he designed his writing this way. If he didn't design his writing this way, the Holy Spirit did. Because there's this pivotal point. All before verse 30, you see Jesus telling everyone that he encounters, don't tell anyone. And that's kind of counterproductive to the gospel. It's kind of counterproductive to the gospel that Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. You've got this big job that I've told you about, but go back to Jerusalem and wait. Pray and be ready for the, the receiving of the Holy Spirit. See, he's telling them at this point they're not ready because they haven't received the gospel message. Their mind isn't focused on this yet. They still think that Jesus is going to save them from persecution. But Jesus is calling them to live a life of suffering and persecution. What greater love a man has than to lay down his life for his friend. To not worry about the things that you used to think were so important anymore, but know that it's so much more important to live a life and teach your children and grandchildren and your friends and everything else about Jesus Christ. And if you don't live the life that you profess that you believe in, then you'll be labeled as a hypocrite. Someone who wears a mask and is just acting on a stage rather than someone who's genuine. Have you decided to follow Jesus? Do you believe His message? All of it, not parts of it. Because Jesus is clear, you're either for Him or you're against Him. You either believe or you don't believe. Then you get to the second half, and remember to look at that through Peter's perspective, because Peter's been taught all this and been told to stay quiet also. And then in the second half, he's told to be bold, but yet he puts his foot in his mouth so many times, right? In Mark 18, 27, you'll re start reading this. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? You're getting to this question. They replied, that would be his disciples and those following him around. Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. So Jesus redirects the question, verse 29, But what about you? Who do you say I am? And who answers? Peter. Now this is either because it's from Peter's perspective or, or whatever reason, or, or just the fact the Holy Spirit's trying to teach us to be bold, but yet our boldness and power doesn't come from ourselves; It comes from God Himself as we die so that He might live through us. Peter answered, You are the Messiah. The question that we're struggling with, is Jesus Christ Lord of all? Because He's not Lord of some. He is Lord of all. But you have to decide if He's Lord of everything you have. It's a, a question that Peter struggled with, that we all struggle with, because we all want to do what we want to do. That's why Paul said, why do I continue to do what I don't want to do? But praise be that there is an answer, and His name is Jesus Christ. Verse 30, Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about Him. Hmm. Because, see, they wouldn't give up everything at this point. They didn't understand everything at this point. They proclaimed with their mouth, but He really hadn't penetrated their hearts so much yet. They said, yes, I'll follow you anywhere, but did they really, truly mean that? Peter, in my opinion, didn't fully understand that at this point. But as we see this progression going on in Mark's writing, we'll see that change in Peter. Verse 31, He, Jesus, then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that He must be killed, and after three days rise again. Mark has established who Jesus is, so now he's going to begin to write about what Jesus teaches. This is the split that I talk about. He spoke plainly. There's where you look for these key words, too. Now he becomes more intimate. 
Because Peter has said, you are the Messiah. It's kind of like when I asked my dad, Dad, will you teach me about something? And I'm on my phone. He's not going to teach me. I come back and say, Dad, will you teach me something? And I'm still distracted. Or I come back, Dad, will you please teach me this? Now I want to learn. Peter had declared that Jesus was the Messiah, so now Jesus started to talk frankly with them, plainly with them. And Peter <laughs> took him aside and began to rebuke him. See, he doesn't understand. Mark's writing this from Peter's perspective again. Remember that. Jesus is saying, I am going to suffer for the kingdom. And if you're my follower, it should already be understood that you are because you've already said you're willing to give up everything and come follow after me. Verse 33, But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, so that includes the others besides Peter, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. Boy. Not you're acting like it or anything, but get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God. Here we go. There's one of those buts. What you have is merely human concerns. You're still worried about where you're going to get your next meal. You're still worried about what you're going to wear. You're, st you're still worried about how others will view you. Oh, you're still worried it might cost you your life. When Jesus becomes so important that the other things don't matter, then you truly realize what God gave by giving His Son to die for you. Verse 34, Then He called to the crowd. These are all those that said, We follow you. They called to Him along with His disciples and said, Whoever wants to be My disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow Me. That's Jesus' next words. This is to everyone who says, I want some of this about Jesus. It sounds like a good thing. And Jesus says, really? Then if you do, you'll deny everything that you ever thought about before, all your cares, your worries, your passions, everything else. You'll take up your cross, your instrument of suffering and persecution, and you'll follow me wherever that road takes you because that road leads to eternal life. It doesn't finish there, though. Verse 35, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel, they will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when He comes in His Father's glory with His holy angels. Now, when you get to that part in, in Mark, and it's going to be next week because we're on three. It'll be five days from now. I guess it'll be Friday. Think about the shift in Jesus' words from here on. Are you really listening to His teachings and you're really going to follow Him from this point on? Because Mark has set up who He is and Jesus has said, if you don't love Me this much, then you're not truly Mine. Do you love Me this much? The Gospel of Mark is a gospel about the suffering servant, Jesus Christ, and your call to follow Him, if, in fact, you believe. Verse 34, Mark 8 says, He told the crowds and His disciples, Whoever wants to be My disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow Me. So which group do you belong to? So we'll fast forward a little bit further and go to Mark 10, verse 42. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them? Not so with you. This is a little more intimate teaching to His disciples. That's not going to be the pattern with you guys. I've called you to give up, and, and I'm going to build on that teaching a little bit. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Because there's nothing wrong with wanting things. It's do you want eternal things or do you want earthly things? And whoever wants to be first in this future kingdom must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man, even Jesus, God's only Son, did not come to be served but to serve 
and to give His life as a ransom for many. See, as you read along, you're going to see these teachings of Jesus become a lot more intimate, but also call for a lot more faith on your part. And you're going to struggle just as Peter struggled. But if you believe, you've been given a new heart. That's why I printed out those verses to you. The finished work was done on the cross. You are righteous. You've been justified by your faith. You have nothing to fear. If God loves you that much and sent Himself to reside in you, then if He's for you, who can be against you? And if you do this with all fervency and with all your heart, then you're going to be rewarded eternally for it. Wow! What a great gospel this is. Now let me point out something else that's in Mark. There's a Greek word used. It's E-U-T-H-E-O-U-S. Eutheos. It means immediately. It's how it's translated most times. Did you notice that in your reading so far? Because you've read it several times. Immediately they did this. Immediately they did that. Without any hesitation they did this. You'll find it in Mark 1, verses 10, 18, 20, 21, 29, 30, 31, 42, and 43. Just in Mark chapter 1. Because Mark is telling you what Jesus said, and He's calling you to be a servant and follow after Him, but He's calling you to do it immediately, not to give Him excuses. If you read the NLT, it doesn't recognize the word as much. In verse 18 and 20, it says it once. In verse 30, it says right away. In verse 42, it says instantly. But you notice I gave you a lot more times that it was used than that. The NIV does a better job. In verse 18, it says it once. Verse 20, without delay. 21, began. Verse 29, as soon. Verse 30, immediately. Verse 31, left her. So you have to just assume the immediately part. Verse 42, immediately. Verse 43, at once. Mark goes on to use the word 40 different times in the gospel so that you see that your calling is not something to be delayed. Why? Number one, Jesus said so. Number two, if you delayed, what happened along the way that you missed out on? Or better yet, who you missed out on telling them about Jesus? If what Jesus did for you is valuable to you, if you've accepted that gift, then you don't want to delay you want to immediately tell anyone you can. You want to immediately start reading your Bible, gathering together, praying, thanking God, singing songs of praise, everything else that's tied together with it. Because if you truly believe that, you want to grow to maturity. You want to do a good job for your Father in heaven. In verse 3... There is a different form of that word. Forty times that word is used, but there are different forms. That's an adjective. Okay? And there are adverb forms of it, noun forms, forms of it, verb forms of it. An adjective form of the same word means well-placed, fit, useful, well-disposed. The verb means to make or run a straight course, to be of good cheer, joy, and courage. And the noun form of it means to be upright or righteous. So the first time any form of those words are used is in Mark 1, verse 3. Just three verses into it. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths. There's your word for Him. So not only does the word mean immediately, but it also means straight forth. The straight path. The only correct path to following Jesus is to immediately respond to His voice. Jesus, as we, when we read John, will say that He's the, the shepherd and His sheep should listen to His voice and they don't listen to any other. Isn't immediately implied? Let's go to your child. You teach them to respond to what you tell them immediately because if they don't, that second or two or three delay might cause them to run out in that road and get hit by that car. They should respond immediately to your voice, just like you should respond immediately to the voice of Jesus. It is the only straight path for a believer, a disciple of God. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, who He is, what He teaches. So many times we get the who He is, but we forget what He teaches to us. 
He became a servant and taught us to be a servant also. That's the gospel according to Mark that you're going to read. It is the gospel that forever changed his life and made him become a servant of Jesus Christ. Is this the same gospel that you believe? And if so, is your life living proof of what you believe? Now I'm going to skip to Matthew for a second. <laughs> you didn't see that coming, did you? And tell you a little bit of sto a little story. In Matthew 24, Jesus begins talking intimately with his disciples. And he teaches them about things that must come. And it's one of those chapters you're not going to figure it all out. Don't worry. <laughs> Some of the things he's talking about is what's going to come there in their lifetime. Some of the things he's talking about will come when the Son of Man comes again. But he tells them these things that must come. Kind of like when you're reading Revelation. You don't have to figure it all out again. We know these things might come, kind of like that movie. So we need to have faith when those days come because you don't know what you're going to do. But Jesus tells all these things, and in verse 25, he starts telling some parables to give further teaching illustrations on that. He tells a parable about ten virgins who have been invited to a wedding feast. You know the story. He tells a story about some servants who have been left behind while their master is gone, and, and they've been given money or talents or gifts or whatever you want to say so that they are good stewards of what the master has given until he returns. And then the, the chapter finishes with the Son of Man returning and separating goats out of his sheep pasture. Let me put it that way. Because all this time there have been plenty of goats in the sheep pasture. Goats aren't really sheep. They may bad, they may do whatever, but they're not sheep. They don't have the same DNA Sheeps are a new creation in Jesus Christ. And one day when Jesus returns, He will separate the sheep and goats. Here's what He says about the talents in Matthew 25, 14. Again, it will be like a, a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one He gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went out at once and put his money to work and gained five more bags. So also the man, so also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts for them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with many things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathered where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid our, your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has been given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have... Even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew chapter 25 has 46 verses. Smack dab in the middle of that would be verse 23, right? Well done, my good and faithful servant. If you didn't notice, that was the response to the man with two bags who gained two more bags. Verse 21 was the response to the one who did five bags and gained five more bags. Verse 21 and verse 23 are identical verses word for word. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. 
You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. What a fabulous promise and teaching to hold on to Jesus. If you're faithful, He'll give you more. But look at the next part of that verse. We forget that one sometimes. Come and share your master's happiness. Not only will you get eternal rewards if you build up them here and now, but you will share in God's happiness for a job well done. Wow. He's happy with what you have done with your life. You ever notice the top ten thing? David Letterman used to do that. I don't know if he still does. Top ten reasons or top, however many top ten, uh, tops ones he does. He gives top ten things or however, like I said, it might be five. I don't know how many it is. I gave you top ten reasons to become a good servant and not to delay. Number one, God entrusts people with what he gives them in this life. Number two, he always gives what we need to do his work. Number three, he gives differently to different people, but expects them to be good stewards of what he's given them. Number four, some do not use wisely what God has entrusted to them, even if it doesn't seem like much. Five, servants are called to do the work of the master, not their own, for they have been purchased. They are owned. Number six, God rewards those who are good stewards of what he has entrusted to them. Number seven, the harder you work for the kingdom, the more treasures you'll build up. Number eight, everyone will give an account to the master. Number nine, there are serious consequences for not taking seriously the job that God has entrusted you. Number ten, and I think maybe you saw this from this passage, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for those who don't expect it. I don't know about you, but that's just ten reasons to immediately take up your, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow after Him. I don't know about you again, but I live to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. And to know that I can come into His happiness with the job that I've done. Revelation 22, verse 7 and 12, you had them on your sheet, says, Look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. Verse 12, Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. Now i got a question for you. Who read their Bible through with us in 2019? Come up here. For you that are a little behind, you can finish. Come up here that you did. Did Teresa do it too? I want to say extra kudos for Mark and Teresa because the husband and wife team read together. Sherry and I made it through. We made it January 1st. I told you I was behind, but I completed it all on January 1st. First of all, give them a hand. <laughs> Second of all, this is my gift to each of you. You might have to get gla reader glasses. <laughs> I don't know what the t oh, yeah. typeset is. This is an NLT chronological study Bible. The NLT is what I read through this year, and I told you sometimes it's a real good translation, sometimes it's not as good as others. They all have their pluses and minuses. But what this does is lays it completely out, where the ESV took you here to there. If you find, for example, the passage on Mark, then you'll have the Luke and Matthew passage right side by side. Now let me see if I can find it. It's harder to go to a certain... Uh, text in this. Because it's all laid together. But if you read continuously through, you'll love it. So I'm on page 1344. And see you have, in the header, Jesus describes his true family. It has below it that it's a parallel and has three dots, meaning that it's found in three sections of Scripture. It gives you Matthew 12, 46 through 50. Then you read Mark 3, 31 to 35. Then you read Luke 8, 19 to 21, right there. And then you'll see that afterwards in teaching, the next thing that Jesus taught, which you'll read Monday, is the parable of the four soils. 
and that is found in three different ones. So if you want a true chronological Bible, it reads right through, and then it gives you um, commentary and stuff at the bottom. So my gift for a job well done. So I'm going to close in prayer. Don't forget that the 5x5 five five plan is up here. If you want to read further, I've got the devotionals. Once I give out Bibles and everything, if one of you guys want one, you can buy one from me. I'm not giving it to you because they earned it by their work. I have extra, and I'm hoping some of you that are still behind because I know some other names will finish and then get yours. I'm proud of you that have, and I'm proud of you that are going to. Because we should gather together as the church is in Acts, and you'll see that in this month also, that they set aside everything of this world and they met together regularly. They spent time in God's Word. They prayed for one another. That's Jesus' body. Father in heaven, we do thank you that Jesus came as a servant, gave up heaven. He didn't consider who he was something to be used for his own advantage, but laid it all down to save us to show us the way to live a set-apart, holy life which you require, a life that we cannot live on our own, but as we read your word and rely on your spirit, that we can become more and more like Christ. In Christ's own word, he's, words, he said, to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Lord, I thank you for each and every one here. Lord, I pray right now that you're working on our hearts to immediately respond to you, to build each other up, not to tear each other down, to look forward to the day that Jesus Christ is returning, when He'll wipe every tear from our eyes, and where everything will be perfect for all eternity, where your children reside with you. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.